Mind and Matter by G. F. Stout Book 2. The Psychophysical Problem Chapter 3. Parallelism versus Interactionism 1. The Question at Issue The disagreement between metaphysical parallelism and interactionism is by no means so fundamentally important as their disagreement with the common enemy, materialism. Comparatively speaking, their opposition to each other is a domestic quarrel. It will be most convenient for us to deal first with this narrower question. Materialism being excluded, which of the other alternatives is preferable? And is either ultimately tenable as a metaphysical theory? We may here confine ourselves to the body-mind problem. Setting aside universal parallelism and universal interactionism, for these are only a transference to the universe in general of a relation supposed in the first instance to subsist between mental process and certain occurrences in living organisms. Neither doctrine can be legitimately extended in this way unless it can first justify itself in a narrower application. The question is whether mental process immediately acts on relevant nervous process and inversely, or whether they simply go on together and vary concomitantly without causal connection. The problem is, in the first instance, scientific. We pass to metaphysics only when, denying or ignoring the limitation of the scientific standpoint, we treat either view as complete and final truth. The parallelist asserts a relation of mind and body, which has no real analogy in the general order of nature as known to science. Hence, though neither view need be fundamentally incompatible with common sense, yet the hypothesis of interaction is prima facie the more natural and obvious, and the onus probandi lies on those who reject it. Indeed, the only way in which the parallelist can support his own position is by showing that interaction is untenable, and that the only tenable alternative is that which he offers. Whichever view we may prefer for purely scientific reasons, the question still remains whether it is philosophically adequate. Can mere interaction, on the one hand, or mere concomitance and covariation on the other, constitute the whole connection between mind and body? 2. How it is to be decided. From the purely scientific standpoint, it would seem that a decision ought to be possible by an appeal to empirical evidence, to observation, and experiment. If mind and brain interact, why cannot we discover interaction between them in the same way as we discover that different parts of the nervous system interact with each other? As a matter of fact, there is no relevant empirical evidence accessible to the physiologist and physicist. And this of itself is used as an argument against interaction. If nervous process and correlated mental process do not act on each other, we should not expect to find changes in the course of bodily events not traceable to physical conditions, either within or without the organism. No such change being discernible, it is inferred that they do not exist. This argument, which is examined in section 3, proceeds on the assumption that wherever there is interaction, science requires the fulfillment of certain general conditions, such as the transference of energy. The contention is that these conditions are not fulfilled in the relation of physical and mental phenomena and that therefore there is no interaction between what is physical and what is mental. Scientific interactionism becomes metaphysical when it claims, overtly or covertly, to be the ultimate solution of the psychophysical problem. As a metaphysical doctrine, therefore, it must mean not only that there is direct interaction of bodily and mental phenomena, but that this interaction by itself constitutes the only direct connection between them. 
It may be urged against this view, and, as I hold, cogently urged, that it is incompatible with the very conception of interaction and of causal process in general. But it does not follow that we ought to accept mere parallelism, for it is just as difficult to hold that the sole direct connection is mere concomitance and co-variation. In both cases, a more ultimate connection is presupposed. These metaphysical questions are dealt with in section 4. 3. The Scientific Argument from the Absence of Empirical Evidence The general principle of the argument is that if there are changes in the body due to the immediate action of an immaterial agent, we ought to be able to detect these changes, and that in fact we cannot discover their presence. One side of the position of the opponent of interaction is here unassailable. We have not so far discovered any bodily process which may not, so far as we know, have followed from purely material conditions. In the present state of our knowledge, we have no positive evidence that purely mental agency ever strikes in upon the flow of bodily processes so as to give it a turn which it would not otherwise take. There are no ascertained empirical facts incompatible with parallelism. But the other premise of the argument is more doubtful. The parallelist has not entirely succeeded in showing that if facts incompatible with parallelism existed, we should, with our available data and methods, be certain of detecting their presence. Indeed, he does not even attempt to show this, except in one special argument based on the law of the conservation of energy. In the current statement, there is often much confusion about the point at issue. It is often taken for granted that the law of conservation directly excludes the possibility of mind acting on matter. But this is quite a baseless assumption and virtually leads to a petitio principi. In the law of conservation, the possible intervention of an immaterial factor is not taken into account at all. All that it commits us to is that if, and so far as material events are due to material conditions, gain or loss of energy in one direction is always balanced by equivalent loss or gain in another direction. Nothing is asserted of what may or may not happen if, and so far as, conditions come into play which are not material. The argument against mental agency if it is to have any force at all, must be empirical and must be stated as follows. Mind cannot act on body without giving rise in the body to a gain or loss of energy which is not balanced by any equivalent loss or gain. But no gain or loss of bodily energy is discoverable which is not balanced by an equivalent loss or gain. Therefore, Mind cannot act on body at all. Now, there is fairly good evidence for the minor premise in this syllogism. It has been shown by carefully conducted experiments that, on an average, over a long space of time, the total amount of energy given out by the body in heat and movement balances that received by the food eaten and the air breathed. Footnote. Confer broad the Mind and Its Place in Nature, page 105. End footnote. There seems to be no likely way of reconciling this result with the view that the mind's action increases or diminishes the total amount of energy in the body. There is no mode of reconciliation which would seem likely to anyone who does not start with the preconception that they must be reconciled at all costs. The minor premise may then be regarded as at least extremely probable, but the major is open to question. The action of mind on body need not necessarily involve any loss or gain of bodily energy. Quote, 
There are cases where it is not true even of purely physical transactions, and even if it were always true in the physical realm, it would not follow that it must also be true of trans-physical causation. Take the case of a weight swinging at the end of a string, hung from a fixed point. The total energy of the weight is the same at all positions in its course. It is thus a conservative system. But at every moment, the direction and velocity of the weight's motion are different, and the proportion between its kinetic and its potential energy is constantly changing. These changes are caused by the pull of the string, which acts in a different direction at each different moment. End quote. Footnote. The Mind and Its Place in Nature, page 107. And footnote. Quote, Why, asks Mr. Broad, should not the mind act on the body this way? End quote. I am not prepared to give any a priori reason why it should not so have acted. But I have the greatest difficulty in making the hypothesis cover the relevant facts. What ought to correspond to the varying pull of the string is not only the varying direction, but the varying intensity, duration, rapidity, and complexity of the whole cognitive process. But the cognitive process requires for its existence and its development a supply of nervous energy proportioned to its intensity, duration, rapidity, and complexity. Much energy may be used in this way, whereas the ensuing movement, e.g. signing a document, may require very little. When my body is enfeebled by fatigue, ill health, or want of food, I become incapable of the sustained and strenuous effort of making a momentous and difficult choice. If I start in full bodily vigor, the struggle of making up my mind may leave me so exhausted as to be no longer capable of hard mental exertion. Now, where does the energy used in the mental process come from, and where does it go? Is the mental energy identical with nervous energy? Or are they two distinct but parallel and covariant? To adopt either of these alternatives is, so far, to reject interaction. On the other hand, if interaction is to be maintained, how is this possible without some interchange of energy between mind and matter? Mr. Broad may be able to find a way out of such difficulties, but only, I think, by making special and far-fetched assumptions which find little or no support in physical analogies. Even so, the utmost that his and similar arguments can show is that it is not impossible for merely mental occurrences to produce a change in the material world. They do not supply any reason whatsoever for asserting that this is so. No one would attach importance to them who did not think that he had independent grounds for maintaining interactionism at all costs. Interactionism, instead of being, as it appears at first sight, the simplest hypothesis from the scientific point of view, turns out to be the most complex. The special assumptions which it involves, being otherwise unverifiable, lend it no support, but are rather a dead weight on it. 4. The Metaphysical Question A properly metaphysical issue is raised when it is asserted on one side, and denied on the other, that interaction between body and mind is, from the nature of the case, impossible. Its intrinsic absurdity is generally maintained by the thoroughgoing parallelist. He asks, for instance, such questions as, how can the thought of a beefsteak alter the position or motion of molecules? He takes for granted that the question answers itself. It is for him evidently absurd that the thought of a beefsteak can do anything of the sort. If he is pressed to point out wherein the impossibility consists, he usually replies that it is due to the utterly heterogeneous nature of what is material and what is mental. 
he thus commits himself to the principle that some likeness of nature between interacting existences is an indispensable prerequisite of their interaction. But, to many competent students of science and philosophy, this principle does not seem self-evident at all. And against these opponents, the parallelist can do nothing but reaffirm his own view. As I have already indicated, it is a mistake thus to rest the case against interaction merely on the disparity of nature of the material and the mental. The real question is whether two existences can interact unless they are comprehended within a spatio-temporal whole or some other complex unity. Can there be interaction without communion? To me, it seems evident that there cannot. If anyone doubts or denies that this is really evident, the only way in which I can attempt to convince him is by stating the question in such a way that it answers itself. Extended footnote. There is a prejudice against the appeal to self-evidence, because it is supposed to imply a dogmatic claim to infallibility. It really implies nothing of the sort. In relying on self-evidence, I may be deceived, just as I may be deceived in relying on any other kind of evidence. I have to allow for the possibility that I may be committing some fallacy of inadvertence or confusion, so that what I take to be evident is really not so. I ought to admit the probable or practically certain presence of such a fallacy, if sufficiently strong reasons can be adduced for believing that what seems to me to be absurd is nonetheless true. Still, there is some room for doubt on which side the truth lies until I discover for myself, or am shown by others, the nature and source of my error. To the earth flattener, it seems evident, from the nature of the case, that if the earth is round, men at the antipodes must fall off into space. He may be met by arguments showing that the earth is in fact round, though men at the antipodes do not fall off. But, so long as he cannot help finding this self-evidently absurd, he has a ground for doubting the validity of the counter-arguments, and for exercising his ingenuity to show that they are not conclusive. He is satisfactorily refuted only when he is brought to see why he has gone astray in accepting as self-evident what is really not so. The bare fact that what seems self-evident to one person does not seem self-evident to another is far from disposing of the claim to self-evidence. It does indeed indicate a fallacy of confusion somewhere, but it does not determine where it lies. It may be difficult to attain a precise and unambiguous definition of the question at issue. Hence, what is prima facie obvious need not be self-evident, and what is self-evident need not be prima facie obvious. I may add that there can be no evidence without self-evidence, for no inference can be valid unless it is self-evident that the premises cannot be true, unless the conclusion is true. End of extended footnote. Suppose two spheres of existence, A and B, which, if we set aside interaction, are otherwise entirely unconnected, directly or indirectly. There is nothing between them, and there is no part common to both, and no common boundary. How, on this assumption, can they in any way communicate with each other? How can what takes place in A make any difference to what takes place in B or inversely? If we suppose not one B, but several B1, B2, B3, etc., equally unconnected with A, there is no reason why what takes place in A should make a difference to what takes place in B rather than B1 or B2, etc. Thus, if there is no communion between mental and material process, there is no reason why what takes place in my brain should causally determine what takes place in my mind, rather than what takes place in your mind or in any other mind. Inversely, 
There is no reason why what takes place in my mind should causally determine what takes place in my brain rather than in any other brain, or indeed any other part of the physical world. For example, the motions of the planets, or chemical processes in Sirius. It may be said that the ground of interaction between my brain and my mind is the fact that they are both mine. In itself, this is a good answer, but it is logically precluded by the view we are now examining. For on this view, the connection between my mind and my body, in virtue of which they are both mine, consists entirely in their interaction. It cannot, therefore, be a precondition of their interaction. If we approach the psychophysical problem from the standpoint of physical science, interaction is, from the nature of the case, untenable. But parallelism is, for the same reason, equally indefensible if it is taken to mean merely that nervous and mental processes go on together and vary concomitantly. In the absence of communion, there is no reason why they should do so. Mere concomitance and covariation cannot, any more than mere interaction, be regarded as by itself constituting the sole connection between them. All that can be urged against the possibility of mere interaction can be urged with equal cogency against the possibility of mere concomitance. To meet this difficulty, parallelists have formulated what is known as the double aspect theory. Footnote. Confer page 83. End footnote. Mind and body are said to be two aspects or sides of the same thing. But what the thing is, and what is positively meant by being an aspect of it, are regarded as questions which cannot be answered, because they lead beyond the possible range of human knowledge. The theory thus has a positive and a negative side, or an agnostic side. It is a step in the right direction inasmuch as it asserts that in some way or another, there must be communion between matter and mind as parts or partial aspects of one whole. But it is precipitate and dogmatic in taking for granted that the nature of the communion is altogether unknowable. It is no doubt unknowable from the external point of view of physical science. But science is only a one-sided outgrowth of common sense. In primary self-consciousness, which science ignores, we are aware of the self, not as mere mind, but as mind and body in one. 5. Conclusion Both parallelism and interactionism, in their phenomenal form, are indefensible. The parallelist goes astray in holding that, like parallel lines, mental and physical processes can never meet. But the advocate of interaction does not assail his opponent's position on this its weakest point. On the contrary, he makes the same assumption himself. What he asserts is that though mind and matter never meet, they nonetheless can and do act on each other. If, on the other hand, we start from the unity of the embodied self as primarily known in self-consciousness, the ground common both to what we may call phenomenal parallelism and phenomenal interactionism is abandoned. The question, therefore, takes an entirely different shape. We have to ask whether the nature of the unity in which mind and matter meet is such as to admit of interaction. It seems to me that it is not. My reason is, not that they are too loosely, but, on the contrary, that they are too intimately connected. The action of the mind is not the action of the mind only, but the action of the mind and body in one. It is the embodied self which is active and passive. Footnote. I am here anticipating what I have to say at length in Book 4. End footnote. This view is strongly confirmed by and strongly confirms the scientific argument from the absence of empirical evidence of interaction between bodily and mental phenomena. If we take parallelism to mean concomitance without communion, we must reject it. If we take it to mean concomitance grounded in communion, there are strong reasons for accepting it. What is negatively implied in the metaphorical term parallel is not that the processes said to be parallel do not meet, but only that they do not interact.
In treating the special topic of the present chapter, I have further enforced and developed two general principles, which have already been expounded and defended in Book 1. The first is the insufficiency of the scientific standpoint in philosophy. The other concerns causal process. So far as distinct existences causally determine or contribute to determine change in each other, such interaction must be grounded on the co-presence of the interacting factors within the unity of a whole of such a nature that a certain change in one part of it cannot take place without change in other parts. In the ensuing discussion of materialism, I shall extend this principle, applying it not only to the production of change in B by change in A, but to the production of B by A, especially to the supposed production of mind by merely material conditions.